So uh, thanks, Peter. So I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the shot capturing methods for flux reconstruction, kind of looking at how we're developing methods for PIFR and how to uh, improve what we've currently got as a capability. So to give you a sort of an overview of what I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to look at you know why we're interested in shot capturing really at all. Uh, I'm going to introduce this sort of invariance preserving methodology that we've been kind of looking at. I'll show some prelimin preliminary results. Now this work is kind of very much in its infancy, so there's not a great deal of results. We've been really focusing on the mathematics so far. And I'll give you a sort of a summary of what we've got to date, uh, what we're looking at developing further and how we're kind of trying to get it into pipe far. So why shot capturing? So the, a colleague at Texas A&M uh, who does lots of uh, finite element work showed us this uh, pretty snazzy animation, which I hope you can see. Um, and it's uh, Mach 3, inviscid flow past a sphere and it's done with p1 continuous galerkin and we thought it was pretty fantastic when we saw it uh, and we kind of thought well would we be able to do that kind of thing currently with what we have in PIFR and we kind of came to the conclusion we might not be able to do something quite so quite, with quite so much fidelity so I mean we want shot capturing because we want to be able to do more physics right um, the moment we've got these fantastic capabilities Peter's been talking about for incompressible flow and for subsonic flow but really you know we want to get onto the really snazzy stuff we want we want to be able to do shots so what's holding us back is currently our methods are fairly parametric um, you know we've got this uh, AV scheme that does require some degree of tuning for those of you that have used it um, and some of you might be thinking well Will you know we've got all of this key multi-grid capability you know, could we just do some kind of P adaptation? And well, my take on P adaptation, which I know some people might disagree with, is that, you know, P adaptation does present several issues and it would be nice if we had something other than that, you know, issues like um, load balancing and also the fact that just if you start chucking P0 elements into your into your uh, grid, it's going to get something quite expensive. As an example there, you know, P0 for this very simple 1D case, it's just 20,000 elements. So to give an overview of kind of shot capturing within the high order space, um, this is by no means sort of an exhaustive list of methods, but we've kind of got this AV methodology and I kind of add parole up there because that's kind of the method we're doing in PIFR right now. Um, we have some kind of detection based on uh, the modes and we then add on some degree of viscosity, which kind of tries to smooth those out. And it's parametric, it's operationally fairly cheap, uh, and but it's not necessarily you know stable and I mean sort of stable in this really high level mathematical kind of way then filtering and within filtering I'm kind of grouping filtering and spectral vanishing viscosity methods um, they're again parametric they can be operationally quite cheap if you leverage kind of the the GPU and matrix multiplication aspect of it uh, and yeah they're, they're pretty stable of course you know like anything you can make them unstable um, but you know SVV methods uh, you can show that they're stable. Um, and then moving on to like adaptations and moving mesh methods. Are they parametric? Well, they can be, they can't be. It depends on the method you use. It's possible to formulate them without any parameterization. Um, they're not necessarily very cheap. Uh, and to give you an example, uh, Parolov has just been working on a new method where he uh, adaptively moves the mesh such that any discontinuities in the flow sit at the boundaries of our, our elements. And that's quite an expensive optimization problem. Um, but, you know, as you might be able to see, again, stability is not really the issue here. You know, they can be not stable, they can be unstable if you um, handle things incorrectly, but generally they, they can be stable. So the method I'm gonna introduce you to is this kind of invariance preserving methodology and uh, this idea of graph viscosity, but to give you some preliminaries that we're gonna need. If we start off with a 2D element here, I'll just bring up a laser pointer. So we're gonna be focusing at this kind of point here. Um, well, within the element, we then have the other solution points. Um, we then also have the interior flux points. And then we're also gonna bring in the, we've got the exterior flux points. Uh, and if we label this point that we're interested in at the moment, point I, we're gonna group this whole set as being I of I. And really what this, what this set is, is often called sort of the adjacency set. And it's the set of all the points that sort of directly affect this, the value of I. Now you might be thinking, 
you know, the, the solution points in the adjacent cell are going to affect this and that's going to affect kind of the point that I'm at. But we're dealing with in a very first sort of first, uh, first order kind of way, what, what are the values of the points that affect uh, the solution point I'm at. Okay, so with that, we can then in a very like abstract way, we can kind of define any numerical scheme really like this. So we're saying our, our temporal derivative of u or i is equal to some sum of the fluxes. So the method that we're in, we've been looking at, then you add on this, this term onto the, the right hand side. So we've got this dij term and then we've got a difference between one of the points and the point we're at. And we're going to impose two constraints upon this. The first constraint is that cij sums to zero. And well, that, that just comes from conservation. Um, and I would recommend going away, maybe for those of you who's a bit uncomfortable with that, going away if you've got any like PET 1D solvers, going in and sort of testing that out. And then we've got this sum of dij goes to zero. And it comes from our ability, you know, this dii term doesn't really make any sense because this, this difference is going to go to zero. So we're free to set it. And well, what those conditions allow us to do um, they allow us to add in this fi term and this fi term changes the problem slightly so now you might those of you who've done much new, with numerical methods might notice that this now looks like a Riemann problem we've got a, an average of our fluxes and we've got a, a difference of our conserved variables and so this is a Riemann problem we're going to treat it that way so we're going to calculate dij like this. So we've got these lambda max terms, which are our maximum eigenvalues. And we take the max of these two. And what this is really doing is it's looking at the Riemann problem from the two directions, from i going to j and from j going to i. And that takes care of any nonlinearities in our mesh. So obviously we can, we've also been looking at maybe there are other ways to solve this. So maybe using row or some of these other methods, but for the time being, we've just been using this very sort of Rusinov type way of solving this Riemann problem and getting our diffusion term. Those of you who have done the thing with sort of Riemann solvers might recognize what this is gonna to start to do is change our convective velocities. And given that this set I of I is actually getting quite large, it could change them quite a lot. So this is something we found through numerical kind of tests. And so we developed uh, the, uh, this idea of a scaling factor. And we're gonna set our site scaling factor to be uh, this. So we're gonna take the L2 norm of our divergence of our flux divided by the L2 norm of our divergence of our flux plus this AV term. And what this does is it tries to sort of correct our convective velocities. Now, of course, there are several shortfalls, and this is by no means uh, a substitute for a convex limiter, but we'll come to that a little bit later. Okay, now I, I added this slide in, I realize this is probably a little bit tricky, but are any quick questions on the methodology, I guess uh, we can maybe ask those towards the end. So moving on to some sort of some numerical test cases, test cases. So we've got this sod shock tube test case, uh, the left uh, state it has got a density of one, a pressure of one. Uh, the right state has got a lower density of pressure and both sides have got zero velocity. Uh, we start it with the, uh, the discontinuity at x equals 0.5 and then we run it and we run it on till t equals uh, 0.18. You can see from our reference solution, the way this solution ends up looking is we have a rarefaction here on the left this, we have this central shock, which is a contact discontinuity. And then we have this rightmost shock, which is just a standard shock wave. Now you can see, you know, our, our P2 and P4 without this scaled look pretty rubbish. Um, the convective velocities have been quite largely affected by the dissipation that we've added. When we then start to add the scaling in, which is kind of a substitute for a convex limiter at this stage, um, you can see it's recovering, it's doing a better job. Um, but if we focus, as we up the number of degrees of freedom, you can really clearly see that it's really struggling with that contact discontinuity. And that's sort of not unsurprising given that we're using a, a Rusinov flux. Um, you can check out Toro and see that some of the deficiencies for um, Rusinov Riemann solvers and contact discontinuities it's gonna really struggle with. So moving on maybe now to a slightly more complex test case, we've got this Shuanosha test case. Now, it has a much higher um, density and pressure on our left-hand side, uh, and it actually has a velocity as well. And then on our right-hand side, we've got this sort of 
spatially varying density. So that as this quite powerful shock wave comes through, you then end up with all these sort of high frequency structures on the, um, the left hand side of the shock. And you can see again, you know, our, our version with just with the shock capturing added in, it's really not doing a very good job. Add this sort of scaling in and it's getting the convective velocities to be better. However, it's really missing out on these sort of high frequency structures. And that's really coming from the fact that we're adding a, a Riemann solver between every point uh, in our mesh, uh, every point, in, I guess, in our subdomain, sorry. Uh, and that's really a first order scheme. So this has kind of taken our high order scheme and made it, um, made it first order. So I, the question is, is how can we improve this? And this is where we're sort of at right now is um, how can we make this scheme better? And the answer we've kind of been looking at is this idea of rather than taking a full graph viscosity, using a sparse graph viscosity. So at the moment we're doing a, our graph viscosity, that DIJ term is calculated over all of the points in this, in this set. So instead what we're going to do is we're going to take some sort of subset of points um, which also helps to reduce the computational cost. So if I'm now at this point, I incorporate both the interior and exterior flux points as well as its sort of nearest neighbors in a sort of an L2 sense. And now if we have a, this sparse graph viscosity, what it allows us to do is it allows us to form this sort of, this low order solution. So L, uh, U, UL, where we're summing over this sort of sparse graph. And we modify CIJ so it reflects the sort of the low order nature. And then if we then also add in a high order solution, which is just our standard FR solution, we can now do sort of a convex limiting between these two so that, uh, so that we can kind of take the minimum amount of diffusion necessary that's calculated from this much lower cost, much lower um, diffusion solution, which is also stable and we can add it on to our high order solution with causing the least amount of damage. And that's kind of where we're, where we're progressing now for this method and trying to add in this much more sort of interesting shock capturing method. So just to sort of summarize for you and make it clear what our sort of our direction is. So this is a, a, a non-parametric shock capturing method that we've been sort of looking at um, we're developing a sparse method to try and reduce the cost because, you know, I've got a, an implementation of this in full sort of 3D um, for the full graph viscosity and it, take, it doubles the runtime, which is not really acceptable. So we'd like to bring that down and early tests on the sparse, um, the sparse graph viscosity kind of say you only get a sort of a 10% increase in the runtime. We're currently working on a um, PyFire implementation that's really coming from being driven by Tarek. Um, and then we're developing sort of GPU accelerated convex limiting because this convex limiting is really where uh, the difficulties arrive in terms of uh, how to interface it with a GPU. So there's going to be needs to be some sort of algorithmic changes to the, maybe the way in which we do time stepping to allow us to get this convex limiting in. And that would be sort of the idea being that we just have a different thing you sort of plug in rather than using a standard uh, explicit time step. So, and on that, I'd like to um, thank Tarek for uh, his work on this project. Um, he's been also looking at shot capturing, doing a little bit of shot capturing. This is a, uh, a snapshot from his recent forward facing step simulation, which is using filtering, which is also another candidate, which we might like to, I think we want to also add in as a feature. Um, and on that, I'll take any questions.